Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. My name is Janelle. I'm the director of client support at APG. I've been with the company for about six and a half years now. So today's presentation is going to be an introduction to runway analysis. We're going to go through a high level of overview of what that means. What is runway analysis? A recorded version of this webinar will be available to download after the presentation. It looks like we have a great turnout for the webinar today. I brought on a couple of my colleagues that will answer questions as I'm going through the presentation to make sure we're answering as many as possible. So please utilize that Q&A section on the right side of your screen. For those of you just joining us, welcome. OK, so an introduction to runway analysis. APG was founded on runway analysis. Airlines were performing these calculations through their flight departments long before it was brought to corporate aviation. Our founders recognized that obstacle clearance regulations for part 121 and part 135 were identical and recognized the need for this in business aviation. So how do we perform a runway analysis? A runway analysis is a calculation used to determine takeoff and landing weights using two key elements. Your aircraft flight manual performance data uh, required by airworthiness standards FAR part 25 and FAR part 23 and what data is collected during the flight test phase. Your takeoff flight path gross versus net a reduction of what the aircraft is actually flying versus what runway analysis is giving you credit for. Your takeoff and landing operational requirements. The FAR and EUOPS takeoff requirements match aircraft certification requirements, leaving the AFM as the tool to meet regulatory standards. And the second part of this is your runway and obstacle data, starting with declared distances your instrument procedure design standards considerations for those commonly referred to as TERPs and PANS OPS being the ICAO equivalent and your obstacle accountability area defining the one engine and operative obstacle clearance requirements and how is this data fed into the I preflight genesis and our other applications our runway and obstacle data is updated by a team of airport analysts um, according to the 28 day air act cycle a standard set by ICAO. So every 28 days we're making updates to ensure our data is um, up to date and effective. That data is then processed through our tools and ultimately downloaded directly to the application where it can run standalone without an internet connection. A similar process happens with our aircraft flight manuals. We have a team of performance engineers who digitize those flight manuals again with the capability of being downloaded and um, stored directly on the application. So the FAR certification requirements, both US and ICAO certification rules assume failure of the critical engine and the certification requirements in FAR part 25 and 23 define those AFM performance data requirements. So part 25 addresses the transport and corporate type aircraft and part 23 addresses all other aircraft. The flight test section defines the requirements and this data is collected during the flight test phase of certification. So during the takeoff phase, takeoff speeds, takeoff run, takeoff distance, accelerate stop distance, and all segments of the takeoff flight path are collected. I'm going to focus on takeoff today as we will be doing an in-depth in landing webinar on Wednesday. So stay tuned for that. Um, reading the regulation on the right, the takeoff flight path shall be considered to begin 35 feet above the takeoff surface at the end of the takeoff distance. The takeoff profile is 
broken into two elements, the takeoff distance, beginning at brake release, losing an engine at V1, and climbing at V2 speed to 35 feet. It's during this phase of flight that accelerate go, accelerate stop, and all engines operations are measured. I'll go into this more in a bit, but this is what is used in the field length graphs located in the AFM. The second piece of this is the takeoff flight path. This is where the actual one engine and operative performance data is collected for first segment, second segment, third segment and fourth segments of flight. The gross gradient value must be degraded before it can be used in a flight manual to a net gradient value. Two engine aircraft use a 0.8% reduction factor. FARs and EU ops define an obstacle clearance corridor where all obstructions must be cleared vertically using that net gradient value. So now we've touched on uh, how the aircraft is certified, what regulations state that we need to use this one engine and operative data uh, laid out in the AFM. For US operators, that is part 135 and 121. The takeoff analysis needs to account for environmental conditions, runway length and slope, use of clearway and stopway, and also obstacle clearance requirements vertically to clear obstacles by 35 feet using the net climb gradient in the AFM's one engine and operative performance data. Horizontally, using for you United States operators, Advisory Circular 12091. FAR Part 91 includes these first three parameters, but does not require obstacle clearance. So this is why APG does not provide, this is why APG does provide a no obstacle option in some of our apps for part 91 operators. So a quick summary of the first two regulations. Part 25 and 23 are the standard for certifying an aircraft using one engine and operative performance. And part 121 and 135 require using that AFM data to perform an obstacle analysis. So how to perform an obstacle analysis is defined in that AC. Aircraft have had the requirement to clear obstacles laterally by 300 feet for many, many years, and operators have abided by that. But over time, as technology has advanced and we've been able to provide a more in-depth obstacle analysis, we now consider things like wind drift, navigational accuracy, pilot error, those things that will cause you to deviate from your path by more than 300 feet. So what the FAA has done in conjunction with the TAP working group is establish an advisory circular. What the AC does is it takes those core regulations of avoiding obstacles by 300 feet and gives you a way to comply with that without having the variables of what we touched on before, wind drift, navigational accuracy, pilot error, those types of things. It's a broader corridor and you're looking at more obstacles, but you're protecting yourself from those variables that you can't control. A lot of the AC actually came from uh, an ICAO document, ICAO Annex 6, where they uh, outline general guidelines for obstacle clearance. EASA AIROPS mirrors these guidelines almost identically, as well as many other uh, civil aviation authorities. It's the US that is slightly different in that um we allow a bit of leeway on what obstacles need to be looked at so APG has to look at each individual regulatory authority and how those obstacle clearance corridors vary so I'm going to show you an, an aerial image on Google Earth generated by our obstacle processor tool one moment Okay, so this is an image of the FAA corridor, which is the inner red lines and the outer red lines represent the ICAO corridor. So APG is a very proactive company. We're always looking at ways to better maximize takeoff weights. 
This visualization tool is especially helpful to our airport analysts and EOP designers when adding new obstacles or building new engine out procedures. Of the potentially hundreds of thousands of obstacles our program is considering, our, our, our program is looking at, we select only those that are required for the performance calculation. Should an engine fail or other emergency arise, we have a course of flight we've evaluated for obstacle clearance to meet regulations and to provide a safe path to follow. This is especially critical in high terrain areas like Aspen, Colorado. This is um, 33 DP out of Aspen. You can see that the ICAO corridor picks up a lot of additional terrain points and there are certain airfields where this really does come into play. You can see here on this hill, ICAO is picking up some pretty high terrain that the FAA corridor is not. So it depends on your regulatory authority, what obstacles um, we're looking at. And sometimes we'll create the corridors and procedures for specific authorities because that does vary. All right. One moment, just pulling back up my presentation. Okay, so what obstacle sources are we looking at? Let's go to the next slide. The FAA's NFDC data. So that is the, they publish them distance out and offset as well as lat long based. The FAA's DOF obstacle set, which is um, our version of in route obstacles. Then obstacles from the AIP type A AOC charts, 2.10 obstacles, in route 5.4 obstacles. We also have uh, um, the shuttle radar topography mission, SRTM, terrain data points in our database as well to supplement that terrain data. This provides a terrain data point every 30 meters worldwide. Once the performance data is collected and the airport and obstacle data is stored, we're able to calculate the runway analysis. The runway analysis calculation determines the following limit weights, field length limit, brake energy limit, minimum control speed limit, obstacle limit, takeoff thrust time limit, climb weight, each of these is calculated for a given runway and the most restrictive becomes your performance limit weight. There are additional limiting parameters that we list for the operator in our app as seen in the pre-flight genesis image to the right. One component used to calculate field length limits specifically um, are declared distances. This includes your takeoff run available, which is your runway length available to ground run during takeoff. The takeoff distance available, which is your takeoff run plus a clearway. Accelerate stop distance available, your takeoff run plus a stopway. Landing distance available, your runway length available for landing. So these terms define the characteristics of a runway using the full runway length could result in an incorrect field length limit weight. So these are used in all of our calculations and also visible for you to see in the app. How are declared distance is used to calculate your takeoff weight? Well, TOTA is used in the determination of accelerate go to 35 feet. ASDA is used in the determination of accelerate stop. In the image below, V1 is the airspeed at which you'll either abort takeoff and stay on the ground or continue takeoff and lift off even if you lose an engine. APG provides the takeoff weight that allows the pilot to continue takeoff and meet the required 35 feet above accelerate go, including obstacle clearance beyond that, and also allows a takeoff weight that uh, allows you to stop safely within the accelerate stop distance. I also want to touch briefly on the terms balanced versus unbalanced. 
in our runway analysis calculation, unbalanced util utilizes the clearway and stopway. That means the accelerate weight is calculated using clearway and the accelerate stop weight takes into account stop weight. Both of those distances and weights would be different. The term balanced is used, or the term balanced calculation utilizes the shortest value, most commonly TORA, to determine takeoff weight. So the aircraft manufacturer establishes which method will be used, either balanced or unbalanced. Most corporate aircraft use the balanced approach and they do not take credit for clearway or stopway. How is runway analysis different from the design of instrument procedures? TERPS, by definition, is the U.S. standard for terminal instrument procedures. Outside of the U.S., PANS ops, or procedures for air navigation services and aircraft operations, would be the equivalent. The primary difference between TERPS, SIDS, and ODPs versus EOPs, or engine out procedures, is that TERPS procedures are intended for all engines operating normal operations. EOPs are built on an emergency, in worst case, an engine cut at V1. We're evaluating things differently. Different intentions are being considered. For a SID, that may include noise abatement or ATC preference for air traffic management. Uh, the East Coast is a great example of that, JFK, Teterboro and Newark are all very close together and obstacle departure procedures are built to avoid heavy traffic areas. While these are being considered for TERPs, EOPs are looking at emergency situations. The primary intention here is to stabilize the aircraft and determine the best course of flight. The route AVG is providing is the best for you in that emergency situation. The CHIRPS obstacle standard gradient is 200 feet per nautical mile or 3.3% to a given altitude, all engines operating. Based on terrain, if the climb gradient is higher and close and obstacles are present within 200 feet of the runway, then those obstacles aren't being considered. So CHIRPS only consider, considerational requirement for this is to publish a note identifying the obstacle. Do not publish takeoff minimums or a climb gradient. Instead, identify the obstacle data by note for publication in the takeoff obstacle notes section. The FAA cannot list every obstacle that has been exempt from a TERPS analysis because oftentimes there are too many. So what they do instead is provide a general listing of obstacles in the area. The end result is that it provides little to no benefit to the operator or one runway analysis provider. So poles and trees beginning 249 feet from the departure end of runway, 100 feet right of center line, and up to 54 feet AGL. So the description I just read represent these three separate obstacles. Two of them are not falling within the runway analysis corridor we need to analyze, and the other is your critical limiting obstacle. So from that sentence, it's hard to tell which ones you need to actually consider or let alone find them until you pull out the um, FAA's UDDF survey to determine it yourself. So it's a lot of work to do based on their brief description. TERPS, develop, TERPS development regulations are quite different, especially regarding horizontal clearance, the corridor that you need to evaluate obstacles in. For TERPS, you're dealing with everything from a Cessna 172 to an A380. So you have to consider a very wide area that you're looking at obstacles in, where ERP, EOPs are more finely tuned to the um, aircraft that you're dealing with. You have a closer range of speeds and we're able to optimize weights for that. A good example of how TERPs versus runway analysis considerations are different and following a SID wouldn't make sense in this situation is the Deer Valley 1 departure. You would think being an obstacle departure procedure that it would provide the best route of flight out of the airport and you're going to avoid all the critical obstacles, but in reality it's a left turn off the end of the runway to intercept a radial to the north. 
it's a simple procedure, but that actually overflies some of the highest terrain in the area within about one nautical mile from the end of the runway. So from an obstacle clearance standpoint, it's not the best route of flight. I'm sure there was reasoning for the ODP to be built this way. TURP's considerations are different. In the case of the engine failure, however, you, we can see that this is not the best route of flight. Flying straight out along runway center line to cir circumnavigate that terrain is a better route of flight. The regulations specify you have to meet one engine and operative climb and obstacle clearance requirements that are dependent, that are independent of the TERP's minimum climb gradients. So in summary, takeoff obstacles, notes, not specific, hard to tell where the actual obstacles are. SIDS and their climb grading requirements are intended for all engines operating, engine out procedures, one engine and operative performance data. All part 135 and 121 flights must consider um, your one engine and operative obstacle clearance. Part 91 operations do not need to perform an obstacle analysis, but it's strongly encouraged. And EOPs define a single track and SIDS analyze that larger obstacle area. I did also want to note that we do try to analyze already published procedures at the airport. It's what the pilot knows and f is familiar with. It's all charted. So that familiar familiarity makes the EOP easier to digest and brief before flight. So there's a lot of cases where it will be different and that's perfectly safe and legal. The crew just needs to make sure that they they brief that procedure ahead of time. All right, I'm going to go ahead and look at some questions here.